Hi everyone. Uh, we are now beginning our second chapter, which is actually two chapters combined. This is going to be cardiovascular, and it combines chapters 19 and 20, and it will probably be the biggest set of lectures that we have all semester. This is a really big group of topics, and um, it's going to be kind of jumbled. Actually, what we will do is begin with chapter 20, which is what this lecture is going to be. Then we're going to fall back and cover chapter 19 over a few lectures, and at the end, we'll jump back into chapter 20 and wrap that up. So this will be several lectures going into this next batch of lectures. Um, and let's go ahead and get started with our attendance question. I'll give you guys a minute to read through this and answer it on your own before I give you the answer. But you can see this is another big one that will require a little bit of critical thinking, another case study question. So you went on a vacation to Africa and picked up a nice case of dracunculiasis. This thing will live in you for up to a year undetected, mating and eventually traveling to your foot or calf. There will be excruciating pain that is alleviated only by placing your leg in water. The guinea worm responsible for all of this detects that water and ruptures through your foot or leg, spilling the eggs into the water to infect water fleas that may be in the area, which then might eventually find their way into another human continuing the cycle. If you're the health conscious type, you might have gone on to the doc you might have gone to the doctor sometime in that year of no symptoms and had some blood work performed. What might show up on your results that could give you a heads up about having that worm burst through your foot? And really that's all that it could do is give you a heads up because unfortunately there is no cure or treatment for this nastiness. So let's think. Uh, really the key thing here, even though that's a lot of wording, What's the key factor is the fact that it is a parasitic worm. This thing actually looks like a long piece of spaghetti, about three or four feet long. They are grotesque, um, but they are a parasitic worm. So what in your blood fights parasitic worms? Eosinophils. And if you have a parasitic worm, what would you notice in blood work? Your eosinophil count would be elevated there would be more eosinophils than normal to help fight off this worm. All right, so here is a picture of that guinea worm. And uh, even though this is not going to be on any kind of exam, I do want to talk about it because it's a neat topic, uh, even though it's pretty gross. What we see here is one of those guinea worms coming through someone's foot. And what we can see down here is that guinea worm is being wrapped around a stick. And that's what you do. When the guinea worm comes out, it hurts a lot. But if you don't do something about it, it will just pull back into you. So when it emerges, you can't yank it out because it's very fragile and it would just tear. So instead, what you do is you grab the exposed portion of that worm and wrap it around a stick. And then as that worm slowly emerges over the next several days, you continue to wrap it around the stick so it can't pull back inside you, and eventually the worm emerges fully. Now, even though this is, you know, really gross and it's still a real thing, it's only in a very small part of the world. It's in a certain part of Africa, and it's almost eradicated. It's actually being eradicated by something you may be familiar with called the life straw. If you're a hiker, you've probably heard of this. You may have heard of it even if you're not. It's a device that you can dip one end into dirty water and drink through it, and it filters everything out of that water so that it's safe to drink. Now, the way that this worm survives is like we just saw. It lives inside you, it mates inside you, but it emerges to lay eggs in water. Water fleas eat those eggs, and then when someone drinks the contaminated water, they also drink those fleas, and the eggs hatch inside the person, and the whole thing continues. But the reason that I'm even showing you this picture and talking about it is because of something else interesting, and that you've probably seen these before. Uh, the caduceus rod and the rod of Asclepius, these are symbols of uh, medical industries, and 
there seems to be evidence that what we're actually seeing is a variation of wrapping that worm around the stick. We're not positive, but we have a pretty good idea that what this all came from was a worm being wrapped around a stick. And that's where these medical symbols came from. So now what we're going to do in this lecture actually is talk about uh, different types of blood vessels, what they do, what their similarities and differences are, and actually how some of them function. So first what we're going to talk about are arteries. Now arteries are some of the biggest vessels in the body, and structurally they have three layers. And the layers are called tunica. Tunica means layer. And the innermost layer is called the tunica interna, sometimes called the tunica intima. So the tunica interna is simple squamous epithelium. Now this is the layer that's actually in direct contact with the blood that's inside. So simple squamous epithelium, remember, that's just a single layer of really, really flat cells. This is just the lining of the artery. Now, even though it's not a layer, there is a term that you're going to hear a lot this semester for various organs, and that's going to be something called uh, the lumen. The lumen is just a hollow part of an organ. So the lumen of a blood vessel, including arteries, uh, is where the blood is found. So the tunica interna surrounds the lumen where the blood is found. The middle layer is called the tunica media. And the tunica media is where we find that smooth muscle that regulates the diameter of the blood vessel and elastic fibers that allow stretch and recoil of the blood vessel. So the tunica media actually regulates vasodiameter. And the way that it does that is by either constriction or relaxation of that smooth muscle. That's called vasoconstriction or vasodilation. We'll hear those words a lot in this chapter. Vasoconstriction, the diameter is getting smaller. Vasodilation the diameter is getting larger. And this is under control of the sympathetic nervous system, the SNS. Remember, the SNS is your fight or flight response. When the SNS is up, when your SNS is activated, that causes vasoconstriction, which causes the vasodiameter to go down, to decrease. When the SNS is deactivated, when your SNS activity is down, we get vasodilation. The vasodiameter gets bigger. So SNS controls vasoconstriction, vasodilation, which in turn regulates vasodiameter. Now the outer layer of an artery is called the tunica externa sometimes called the tunica adventitia. The, the tunica externa is an outer, tough, protective layer uh, made of a lot of collagen fibers. All right, so now this next part. Every semester, I, I make a big show out of this, and every semester, it still kind of falls flat. Um, arteries. The function of arteries is to take blood away from the heart. All right? The function of arteries is to take blood away from the heart. All right? Now, I'm going to pause the video here, and then when I unpause it, I'm going to bring up something that most instructors would never dream of doing. I'm going to show you a question that will be on every single lecture exam you take this semester. Not only am I going to show you the question, I'm going to show you the answer choices, 
and I'm going to tell you the correct answer. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video and bring that question up. Okay, so here's our question. This will be on every single exam we do this semester. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, carry blood towards the heart, are the location of nutrient and gas exchange, always contain oxygen rich blood, always contain oxygen poor blood, or more than one of the above. So here's where I would ask everyone to raise their hand if they think that it's A, or if they think that it's B, or if they think that it's C, and I would, I would do that. And most of the students get this one wrong. And when I tell you the exact correct answer, when it comes exam time, I have a handful of students that get it wrong. And on every single exam, despite knowing what the answer is, students get it wrong. But I've already told you what the answer is. So, what do you think the answer to this question is? Arteries carry blood away from the heart. That's it. Students always think that oxygen plays a role in it also, that oxygen uh, is high in arteries. And for the most part, it is. But there are some arteries that have low oxygen. The arteries that are on their way to the lungs to pick up oxygen, well, they're going away from the heart towards the lungs so that they can pick up oxygen. So on an exam, when you see this question, the answer is A. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. So real quick, let's talk about some sense organs that are built into some arteries. And these are going to play a big role when we get to blood pressure a little bit later in this chapter. And again, when we get to respiratory. And these are first up here in the neck. These are called the carotid bodies and the carotid sinus. And even though they're separate, I tend to lump them together because they're in basically the same spot. The carotid sinus and the carotid bodies. And these are baroreceptors, which are stretch receptors, and chemoreceptors, which are sensitive to various chemicals that we'll learn about later in the semester. We also, down here in the aortic arch, we have more baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. So the aortic arch and the carotid sinuses, that is where we will find baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. Baroreceptors are going to be important later in this chapter. We'll talk more about them, so don't worry about what they do just yet. Just know they detect stretch. Chemoreceptors are going to be important when we get to respiratory, and we will talk specifically about which chemicals they are responsive to. Aortic arch, carotid sinuses. So as we're moving away from the heart in the arteries, they're going to branch and get smaller, and then they're going to branch and get smaller, and they keep branching and branching and getting smaller and smaller. Eventually, they are so small that they actually change structure, and we call them arterioles. Really, arterioles are just really small arteries, but there is a little bit of difference to them. Uh, we call them resistance vessels because they regulate something called peripheral resistance. Peripheral resistance is a term we will run into a lot coming up over the next few lectures, and it really is just the resistance provided against blood flow. So we can think of when peripheral resistance is increased, it's more difficult for blood to flow through that vessel. And arterioles are called resistance vessels. They regulate peripheral resistance because they can constrict or dilate really easily. There's a lot of muscular activity here. 
and this will significantly affect blood pressure. So if peripheral resistance increases, blood pressure will increase. We are making it more difficult for that blood to move, so pressure builds up. If peripheral resistance decreases, then blood pressure will go down. We're making it easier for that blood to flow, and pressure will drop. Eventually, we get to the smallest vessels called capillaries. Capillaries are so small, in fact, that they're microscopic. They are smaller than erythrocytes. Now, if we don't count sperm cells, erythrocytes are the smallest cells that humans have. They are incredibly tiny, but capillaries are smaller around than erythrocytes are. So erythrocytes have to bend to get through capillaries. Capillaries are only a single layer thick. They're only that tunica interna or tunica intima, simple squamous epithelium. And that's because of their function. Their function, this is where uh, nutrient and gas and waste exchange occurs. Constantly, fluid is moving in and out of these capillaries. And in that fluid, we have dissolved nutrients, dissolved respiratory gases, dissolved wastes. And that, think back to uh, Bio-137, simple squamous epithelium, its function was to allow diffusion of things like respiratory gases and fluids. Now, capillaries are all over the body, but they're not found in tendons, ligaments, cartilage. Um, so if you've ever torn a cartilage, say in your knee or something, you know that it is a long healing process. And that's because they don't have capillaries to supply them with nutrients, and they can't heal quickly. But going back to capillaries, they are quite permeable. It's really easy for stuff to get in and out of capillaries. And there's different types of capillaries. Some of them are more permeable than others, but this is just kind of a generic capillary, and it shows how do things get in and out. Well, one is just diffusion directly through the membrane. Things that are lipid-soluble can do that. Things that are nonpolar, they can diffuse straight across the cell membrane because remember, things that are lipid soluble, nonpolar, they can cross the cell membrane. But since it's only a single cell layer thick, where one cell meets another cell, well, there's this spot right there where the two cells come together called an intercellular cleft. So this is just the spot where two cells come together. And certain substances can actually pass between those two cells. So movement through intracellular clefts, this is where water-soluble or polar substances move in and out of a capillary. Now, some capillaries are fenestrated. Some capillaries have holes in them. We will see some examples of this later in the semester. But some water-soluble substances pass through those fenestrations. And some things actually move through cavioli, so using vesicular transport. So vessels, uh, or vesicles and cavioli, uh, which also produce vesicles, will move substances contained in liquid through one side of the cell, across the cell, and out the other side. Remember vesicular transport from Bio-137. So here we see kind of a generic capillary bed. And first, let me just kind of walk through what it is we're seeing, and then I'm going to talk through this, or this uh, vascular shunt that we're talking about here. So here's the, the flow of blood. Here's an arteriole. And then here it branches into a capillary, which is what we see here. This is a capillary bed. And then blood comes out the other side and goes through some other vessels we'll see in just a moment. But the capillary bed, sometimes we want blood to move into that capillary bed to supply the tissue. Sometimes that tissue may not need 
a big supply, so there's no reason to send blood up into these capillary beds. And instead, blood will take a shortcut through the capillary and out the other side without ever actually going up into these small capillary beds. So let's see what I mean by that. We're going to talk about something called a vascular shunt. And vascular shunts, they have two parts. I'm not too concerned if you know the two parts of a vascular shunt, but meta-arteriole is the side closer to the arteriole. Thoroughfare channel is closer to the vessel on the other side. Together, they make a vascular shunt. Down here, we can see that bypass that I was just talking about. Here, the tissue doesn't need a high blood supply at the moment, so we're just taking a shortcut through that vascular shunt and out the other side. What is an example of this? Let's see. So let's say you are working out. Maybe you went for a jog, maybe you're doing aerobics, something like that, but your muscles are in high demand. They're needing a lot of oxygen, they're needing a lot of nutrients. So if we were to look at the capillary bed in your muscles, we would have blood flowing up into all of these small capillaries to supply those muscles. But at that same moment, if we were to look at the capillaries surrounding your digestive system, well, your digestive system at that moment doesn't really need a lot of blood supply. So here, as the blood came in, it would actually be bypassed and go through this shortcut, through this vascular shunt, and come out the other side without really ever going up into this capillary bed. So how is this controlled? Well, first let's look at some, some more terms. All of these small branching web-like vessels, these are called true capillaries. The true capillaries branch off of that vascular shunt. And where the true capillaries exit, there are these rings of muscles called precapillary sphincters. Sphincter is just a word that means a ring of muscle. When the precapillary sphincters are open, blood can pass through and go up into this capillary bed, these true capillaries, and then exit. When the precapillary sphincters are closed, blood can't get up into that uh, true capillaries, into the capillary bed, and instead it passes through the thoroughfare channel and out the other side. So if we looked at the muscle when you're working out, those precapillary sphincters would be open and the capillary beds would be full of blood. But at your digestive system, those precapillary sphincters would be closed and blood would be shunted through this shortcut, through the vascular shunt and out the other side. Later that evening, you're resting. You're not working out anymore. Maybe you've just finished a big dinner. Well, then this top picture is what your digestive system capillaries would look like. Meanwhile, your muscular system capillaries would look more like this. So they're constantly adjusting based on demands of the tissue that those capillaries supply. Well, when we come out of a capillary, now we're on our way back towards the heart. So we're going to go from a capillary into something called a venule. Venules are just really small veins. And venules range in makeup. Some as soon as we exit a capillary, they're pretty much the exact same thing as a capillary. They're still simple squamous epithelium. They're still really porous. And this is actually where leukocytes can exit the bloodstream really easily so that they can get out into the tissues and check for anything that may uh, be out of place. Others have a very thin tunica media and a thin tunica externa, so they're a little bit less permeable. And as we get further and further from a capillary, we're going through venules that join with other venules to get a little bit bigger and join with other venules to get a little bit bigger. 
until we're in veins. Veins are the larger vessels carrying blood back to the heart. So they have the same layers as arteries, but the, the tunica media is much thinner. And since the tunica media is much thinner, the lumen, the hollow part, is much bigger. The hollow part of a vein is very big, and the wall is very thin. And their function is to carry blood back towards the heart. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with oxygen. It's just the function of a vein is to carry blood towards the heart. Sometimes they are called capacitance vessels because at any moment they have over half of the blood in your body. They have about 65%, 64% of the blood in your body found in veins at any one moment. And they are very, very low pressure. So normally when we think about blood pressure, we hear something like uh, 120 over 75 or 120 over 80, and those numbers uh, you know, are pretty big numbers. But when we talk about veins, the pressure, we're so far away from the heart, and we'll see later, the further you get from the heart, the lower the pressure is. It drops with distance from the heart. When we get to veins, the average is about 10 mmHg, millimeters of mercury, as opposed to 120 or 80. We're down to 10. And really, by the time we get to something called the vena cava, the blood vessel that returns blood to the heart on the right side, the pressure is less than 2 millimeters of mercury. It's pretty much immeasurable. You can't detect it. And because of that, veins have to have a little bit of help to make sure that the blood still moves through. Valves are present in veins. If we were to dissect a vein open, it's not just hollow. It's got small flaps, small valves, that let blood move through one way and prevent it from moving back the other way. In addition to that, since the pressure is so low, it's hard for blood to move through veins. The heart pumping, you know, that was so far back that we're not really feeling a heartbeat anymore, so we rely on something else to push blood through, veins. And those are muscular pumps and pulmonary pumps. So here's what that is. Every time we move a muscle, it you know, gets thicker and then thinner and then thicker and then thinner as it contracts and relaxes. And veins actually run between muscles a lot of the time so that as those muscles get thick and thin, thick and thin, it's kind of like they're squeezing the veins. And because of these valves, blood can't go back this way they're only going to let blood pass through this way back towards the heart. So if we were to pretend this was a leg muscle, down here would be your foot at the bottom, up here would be towards your heart, so it would be your upper leg. When you move your leg muscles, it squeezes on those veins, blood is pushed, but it can only go towards the heart. These valves prevent that blood from going back toward, towards your foot. And this happens all over the body. These valves have veins, and when you move your muscles, it pushes blood through. Similarly, in your chest, we have something called pulmonary pumps. Every time you breathe and your lungs expand and contract, the pressure in your abdomen and chest changes, and it squeezes these vessels, these veins, pushing blood back towards the heart. So this image is just to show you what I was talking about, about the thickness of the wall of an artery versus a vein, uh, also the size of the lumen of an artery or vein. Up here in the top left is an artery, down here in the bottom right is a vein, and if they were both full of blood, they would have the same diameter. We can see this pink area right here, which is the tunica media, this is that wall, the, the muscular wall. In an artery, it's so thick compared to a vein where we hardly see it at all. Now, also, we have this hollow area right here, the clear area. That's the lumen. That's where the blood would be. In an artery, we can see that it is not very large at all, but in a vein, it's extremely large. 
So here we have uh, something a lot of us are familiar with, which is varicose veins. And varicose veins form because of a failure of those valves. They're called incompetent valves. And these are really common in people who are on their feet for extended periods of time or who uh, are obese or who carry excess weight. Maybe they're weightlifters. Maybe their job requires them to carry weight. Whatever it is, it's because of these valves are no longer doing their job properly. So if we're looking here in the legs, we can see that the, the valves, they're supposed to let blood go through this way towards the heart, but not back this way because of gravity. But in varicose veins, those valves fail, and blood, instead of just passing through one way, blood starts getting pulled back the other way. And since those walls of the veins are so thin, they don't have a lot of that tunica media, they're not very strong. And they can't withstand the pressure. If blood is flowing back this way, there's more blood in this area than normal. And it can't withstand that pressure, so the walls of that vein distend. They start to expand. And that's what varicose veins are. So I'm going to give you a heads up. The next picture can be a little bit uh, stomach turning, a little bit rough, but, oh, well, that's not what I was looking for. I guess I took it out. There is actually uh, another type of varicose vein that we're familiar with called a hemorrhoid. And hemorrhoids are just varicose veins in a very unfortunate place. Apparently, I took the picture out because I had, uh, I guess, some compassion. I didn't want people to, to have to endure that. It was not a photograph. It was an illustration. But, yeah, uh, hemorrhoids are just varicose veins in a very unfortunate location. Hemorrhoids typically come about because of either prolonged constipation or childbirth, uh, straining for various reasons, uh, obesity, all of those things can cause hemorrhoids. But again, they are just a special type of varicose vein. So, what we see here is how capillaries work. We're going to talk about how capillaries work. And capillaries, remember, this is where fluid and gas and waste exchange occurs at the tissues. But this is how your book presents it. And this is on page 759. But I'm going to show it to you in an illustration so that you're not just looking at these numbers trying to figure out what they mean. We're actually going to go through and apply these numbers one at a time and see what each of them actually mean. But I will tell you that I am not asking you to know these numbers by heart. I do, I do not ask you to memorize numbers in this class except for one time near the end of the semester. These numbers you do not need to know. What I want you to know is what do they represent. So I'm going to pull up a diagram here and we're going to walk through this one at a time. Okay, so what we see here is uh, the, the red thing running across the screen. That is a capillary. So this is going to be where that uh, exchange takes place. We're going to draw capillary fluid exchange. Now over on the left, this is the arterial end. Over on the right, this is the venular end. So blood is flowing from left to right in this image. And what we see is... As blood passes through, this liquid is going to be pushing against the walls of the capillary, trying to press its way out. Liquid will press against the walls of its container, and that's called hydrostatic pressure. And down here at the arteriolar end, the hydrostatic pressure, we can measure it. And different books will give you different values. I'm going to try to use the same values as your book, uh, just to keep everything even. And the hydrostatic pressure down here on this end is 30 mmHg. 
Now, this is a good time to talk about pressure. We're going to talk about pressure in several chapters this semester. And every time we talk about pressure this entire semester, the units are always going to be the same. They are millimeters of mercury, mmHg. So the pressure supplied by blood against the walls of the capillary, so we're going to call that the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary, is 30 mmHg. And that is an outward pressure. Now, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than your book. Your book talks about out in. It, I don't like the way your book presents it. So I'm going to show you a much easier way to do this. The hydrostatic pressure of the capillary is 30 millimeters of mercury. But we've also got big solutes in the plasma that are pulling water towards themselves. They are opposing the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary. Uh, you remember what it is that actually supplies most of this pressure, this osmotic pressure? It's the albumin in your blood, the big protein. And the osmotic pressure of the capillary is an inward force. It's actually pulling fluid in. And the osmotic pressure of the capillary is measured at 28 mmHg. But here we see something. We have a 28 and a 30, but they're going in opposite directions. So what I do to make things easier is I'm going to call in negative and out positive. So the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary is 30 mmHg. And the hydrostatic pressure, I'm sorry, the osmotic pressure of the capillary is negative 28 mmHg. But we also have uh, fluid and proteins out here in the interstitium, the area in the tissue in between cells. There's fluid and protein out there also. Now that fluid is pressing against the walls. So it's pressing it back against the wall of the capillary. It's pressing against the walls of the cells. And even though it's pressing against the wall of the capillary, it's pressing against the wall of the cells more. So what we actually do is we get kind of a suction. It's still a hydrostatic pressure, but it's going to create a bit of a suction. So this is going to be ultimately in the same direction. So we're going to call it positive and it's 3 mmHg. The hydrostatic pressure of the interstitium is positive 3 mmHg. And finally, all of those proteins out in the interstitium, they are pulling liquid towards themselves. So that is going to be a positive number, and it's positive 8 mmHg. Now what we do to get the idea of which direction is fluid ultimately moving is we're going to add all of these together. So we have a positive 30, a positive 3, a positive 8, and a negative 28. We add all of those together and we're going to get positive 13 mmHg. Hg, And that positive number tells us fluid is moving out of the capillary. And that's what we want. Because remember, the fluid that moves out of the capillary into the tissues has oxygen and nutrients dissolved in it. It's not just water moving out. It's liquid with dissolved good stuff to supply the tissues. And it's moving out with a force of 13 millimeters of mercury. So what we call that is the net filtration pressure, or the NFP, of the arterial end of a capillary. The net filtration pressure. But as we move through a capillary, and we get closer to the venular end, 
we're losing fluid because it's moving out down here on the arteriolar end. By the time we get to the uh, venular end, then we've lost some blood volume. We still have a hydrostatic pressure of the capillary. We still have an osmotic pressure of the capillary. We still have the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitium. Oh, wrong way. Yeah, it's still going this way, but there's more pulling towards it. And we still have an osmotic pressure of the interstitium. But the numbers are going to be a little bit different. Weirdly, the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitium is not going to change. It's still going to be positive 3 mmHg. Because all of that fluid that's moving out, it's almost immediately getting pushed into the cells that need it. So this number is pretty constant. The osmotic pressure of the interstitium, it's going to remain positive 8 mmHg. Because the big proteins out here, they're not going anywhere. And big proteins that are in the blood are too big to get out. So the proteins out here in the interstitium aren't going to change. So the osmotic pressure of the interstitium isn't going to change. The osmotic pressure in the capillary, the colloid osmotic pressure, is also going to stay the same. Negative 28 mmHg. Those Albumin and the other things contributing, they're too big to go out of the capillary, so they stay the same. The only thing that changes is the hydrostatic pressure, because that liquid that leaves, as it leaves down here, now there's less of it down here. So the hydrostatic pressure is going to drop. It's going to drop to 10 mmHg. And if we add all these numbers together at the venular end, we have plus 10, plus 3, plus 8, minus 28. The net filtration pressure at the venular end of a capillary is negative 7 mmHg. Now there's going to be two important things to take away from this. One, it's a negative number. What does that tell us? What do, num what do negatives mean in this picture? It means that fluid is coming in to the capillary at the venular end, and that's what we want. We want fluid to come in because waste and carbon dioxide that are being produced by these tissues that we need to carry away to get rid of, well, it's coming in dissolved in that liquid that's being reabsorbed. <clears throat> The other thing to notice is over here at the arteriolar end, we've got a force of positive 13 pushing out. Down here, we've got a force of negative 7 pulling in. What does that tell you? More fluid is leaving than is being reabsorbed. Fluid is building up in these tissues, and we have to do something about that. If we didn't do something about that, you would start to swell and swell and swell, and eventually you would have so little fluid in your blood that you wouldn't live very long at all. So what do we do about that? Well, what we do is we have a completely separate type of capillary bed that surrounds our blood capillary bed. We have lymphatic capillaries, lymph vessels, that actually have that fluid that was lost at the capillary moves into our lymph vessels and eventually carried back and returned to our bloodstream. So that when you get to uh, lymphatic and immune, the lymphatic part, the first half of that chapter is self-study. But that is a big part of what it's going to talk about. Fluid that was lost at the blood capillary bed is returned to the bloodstream because of the lymphatic capillaries. 
So that's where we're going to stop for this lecture. Next time we pick up, we're going to fall back to chapter 19 and start talking about the heart. All right, take care, and I will talk to you next time.